Hey all you cool cats and kittens! I hope you're having a good time in quarantine. Today we're going to be talking about the Green Revolution and the Green Movement. Dr. Norman Borlaug is globally recognized as a hero. He's the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Congressional Gold Medal, and India's second highest civilian honor. You might be wondering why, especially if you've never heard of him. It's because his work has saved a billion people around the world from malnutrition and starvation. He worked in Mexico for 20 years with wheat farmers. Eventually, he developed a high-yield, disease-resistant, double-season wheat that increased Mexico's wheat production by six times. He used fertilizers and pesticides. His revolutionary farming practices combated food insecurity in Mexico and even turned the country into an exporter of wheat. Next, he worked in Pakistan and India. His work there nearly doubled wheat production in a short amount of time. He prevented a major famine. Later in his career, he worked in Africa to increase maize, sorghum, cassava, and cowpea production. Borlaug is credited with starting the Green Revolution. In the 1950s and 60s, countries adopted new agricultural technology to help keep up with their growing populations. A notable invention from this time period is irate rice, which is a high-yielding breed of rice. The development of agricultural technology has continued after Borlaug's death in 2014. During my research, I found a surprising number of songs written in appreciation of Norman Borlaug. Here's one of my favorites. The GMO Movement GMOs, or genetically modified organisms, have been used for thousands of years um, in the cases of selective breeding and um, sometimes crop modification through an evolutionary scale. For example, um, Corn, as seen in the picture, has been bred to be monochromatic and have a lot of kernels. And uh, with animals, wolves were bred to become dogs um, over a, period, a long period of time. By the 1990s, food and drugs were um, commonly modified or genetically engineered for convenience and for to be more readily available and um, to be more beneficial to people. However, uh, genetically modified organisms are now considered very controversial. The pros and cons of GMOs. Some of the pros of GMOs were that food was more st shelf stable, so stores could keep it available for longer periods of time, and consumers um, were able to store more food within their homes rather than having to go to markets as often. Um, it also produced drugs like insulin that saved a lot of lives, um, and food could be engineered to deliver more nutrients. Uh, the most common example of this would be golden rice, which was developed um, with extra vitamin A to um, provide to impoverished children who lacked vitamin A in their diets. Um, it also yielded way more crops in smaller areas of land so more people could be fed without having to um, get rid of forests and it um, averted a lot of crises such as deforestation and fam uh, famines in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Some of the cons of GMOs were that plants became immune to certain pesticides um, which meant that they would either need more pesticide to um, keep pests off of them, or that it would harm the soil and plants around it. Um, it reduced soil fertility and genetic diversity, and it also caused soil erosion, which um, greatly harmed the land that these crops were being planted on. Um, it also meant that oftentimes the people being fed some of the more harmful genetically modified foods were the poor and it created um a huge wave of discontent because the poor were being treated as these guinea pigs for gmos um and also as a result of gmos especially within food um toxins entered human bodies and affected pregnancies so um newborn babies and fetuses were uh contracting new diseases because of gmos and it also created a lot of other um, underlying health risks, some of which are still unknown. Um, and it created huge corporate benefits 
but left up millions of peasants farm- peasant farmers displaced and without lines of work. The Green Movement is a social movement. Early conservationists went against the widely held idea that a free market would solve all social problems, and they advocated for the conservation of natural resources. The Sierra Club was founded in 1892, and it sponsored wilderness outings along the Pacific coast. John Muir was its first president. The club soon became politically active, fighting for conservation. In 1905, John Muir and the Sierra Club successfully blocked the federal government from making Yosemite Park smaller. They promoted the creation of the National Park Service in 1916. In 1936, they opened an office in Washington, D.C., where they encouraged conservation legislation. President Roosevelt was concerned about preserving natural resources. In 1906, he signed the National Monuments Act into law. He worked with Congress to establish the National Park Service. Aldo Leopold is known for his wildlife management work in Arizona and his idea of land ethic. He disagreed with Roosevelt's utilitarian views of conservation and believed that humans should be members of of a biotic community, not conquerors of it. Conservation efforts were overshadowed by the World Wars and Great Depression. They began to pick up again in the 1960s because of Rachel Carson's best-selling book, Silent Spring, which drew national attention to the effects of heavy pesticide use on the environment. Her book made people realize that environmental destruction could affect their health and not just the environment. She was labeled hysterical by the chemical industry. President Kennedy ordered the President's Science Advisory Committee to investigate the book's shocking claims. They were true, and in 1972, the pesticide DDT was banned. The Clean Air Act was passed in 1963, and in 1970, it was amended to become more enforceable. The Environmental Protection Agency was established in 1970. Its goal was to prevent and reverse pollution, protect human health, and safeguard the natural environment. It also provides direction, oversight, and assistance to other agencies that have to do with air and land. Events such as the Three Mile Isle incident inspired environmental activism and reform in the 1970s as well. Earth Day. Earth Day and the Earth Day Network are an international organization and day of action which was founded in 1970. On that first Earth Day, about 10% of the population mobilized and um, called and worked for wider scale planetary protection, including the prevention of deforestation, the um, cleaning up and prevention of pollution, and uh, many other environmental actions. Um, They recruit people into movements and drive positive action, and they hold sectors accountable for the damage they cause to the planet. These sectors include individuals and businesses, um, because everyone has their own part that damages the planet, but if everyone does their part to try to reverse their damages and to be better, um, no matter how big or small, the earth will be able to change for the better. Um, And they work to broaden the environmental perspective and create greener energy sources, as well as provide education uh, in a greener manner to those who can't afford it, and to promote the end of pollution. Um, the Earth Day Network is a nonprofit organization that works to allow everyone to have a voice and unite everyone to have a cleaner planet. Greenpeace is a non governmental organization whose mission is to use peaceful action to expose environmental problems and propose solutions. They are international with branches in 55 countries. They are most concerned with protecting the climate, forests, and ocean. The Kyoto Protocol, uh, which was based in Japan, created obligations for control, reduction, and limits of greenhouse gas emissions. It also encouraged developed nations to reduce their emissions emissions up to 20% when compared to 1990s greenhouse gas emission rates. Um, So as greenhouse gas emission rates um, became higher, um, this became harder. It also required nations to report their emissions, but um, they only were able to schedule uh, protocol measures through 2020 because once the United States and Canada resigned from the Kyoto Protocol, um, the entire schedule somewhat collapsed. Um, As seen in the political comic on the right, um, it shows basically um, the United States, rather than um, trying to cut back on their emissions rates, it shows like a cigarette or cigar as a smokestack uh, polluting the air, and the lighter for that being the burning of the documents from the Kyoto Protocol. The Paris Agreement. 
The Paris Agreement aims to reduce climate increase uh, to below 2 degrees Celsius per year. Um, currently, in some nations, it is as high as 4 or 5 or even more degrees Celsius per year, which is really bad because um, usually it takes centuries to create that much um, increase in, cl in surface temperatures. So the Paris Agreement aims to reduce that. It requires all greenhouse gas emitting nations to report, so all nations are involved, uh, not just the most developed ones, as in the Kyoto Protocol. The overall goal was to delay irreparable climate change, mitigate the adverse effects that it's already been causing, and cap yearly temperature increase at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, the U.S. has resigned through Trump, but um, they won't be removed until one day after the election of this year due to the long removal process that the Paris Agreement has um, enforced and see um, and try to prevent climate change. But they also have some differences. For example, the Kyoto Protocol only focuses on um, developed nations and was very binding and had penalties for non-compliance or failure to um, reach the goals that were set. They also had a very loose timeline in periods of about eight years, and it collapsed after the U.S. and Canada resigned. So um, 2020 is the last year that they are operating. Um, the Paris Agreement allows all countries to join and encourages all countries to join um, and is less binding but requires stricter reports. So they don't have any penalties for um, not reaching the, the goal, but they do require um, reports on their emissions and reports on how much approximately um, they are contributing to climate change, so how many degrees Celsius per year they are warming the earth. Um, and they create a new plan or target um, every five years or so. And so, however, they were only established in 2015, so they plan to have a new target this year, and then in five years they'll have another one, etc. Mountain glaciers have shrunk dramatically. Um, you can see the picture here at the bottom is one in Alaska. There's been changes in flowers and plant blooming times. So climate change is happening. The debate is over whether it is primarily human-caused and what we should do about it. The climate change debate. Does human activity cause climate change? So this debate has been going on for a long time, and it will continue to go on because there is so much evidence backing both the argument of yes, human activity does cause climate change, and no, it doesn't. So um, the pro side, the side that says human activity does cause climate change, argues that 97% of climate scientists agree in some extent that human activity is extremely likely to be the cause of global climate change. However, um, several models for climate change are inaccurate, and upon looking at that same survey on a deeper lens, it actually only shows that 37% of climatologists say that climate change is caused by a, com well, yeah, that it's a combination of humans and the environment. 5% say it's mostly the environment, and 5% say that there isn't enough information to say at all. So um, this just shows that people can skew um, data to fulfill their agenda and to fulfill their point of view. Um, back on the pro side, it says that methane gas uh, traps 84 times more heat than carbon dioxide does, and nitrous oxide traps 300 times more heat than carbon dioxide does. Um, and all of these gases are mostly man-made and are completely going into the atmosphere and trapping this heat, which is causing climate change. Um, which These are both um, more present due to agriculture in the 20th century, which is a human activity, and um, the 20th century saw a 1.4 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. Um, however, on the con side of the uh, human activity doesn't cause climate change side, um, it says that the global warming within the 20th century is within the um, plus or minus 5 degree range of the past 3,000 years. So um, it shows that there have been times with uh, where it has been much hotter or much colder um, with no emissions. So the emissions aren't impacting it all that much. Therefore, human activity isn't impacting it all that much. Um, it also, on the pro side, atmospheric carbon dioxide rates are higher than they ever have been because of human activity, including agriculture and industry, etc. Um, and that there's a specific type of carbon dioxide which is directly connected to human activity. Um, however, the con, says, con side um, has proved that carbon dioxide emissions don't actually cause global warming and um, that human-produced carbon dioxide is very easily reabsorbed by carbon sinks, such as um, trees and other um, photosynthetic organisms that absorb that carbon dioxide. Um, also, there are many adverse effects that um, show human causation of climate change back on the pro side, um, such as uh, the ocean activity. So uh, the ocean levels are rising and glaciers are melting and the ice caps are melting, etc. Um, and there are also more freaki frequent and intense droughts and floods and there are more um, intense hurricanes and earthquakes in unlikely places, etc. that um, could be due to climate change, which they believe is due to human activity. Um, but the um, con side argues that a lot of this is due to um, deep ocean currents and the sun and um, galactic positioning, etc., um, that controls these effects and a lot of the temperature of the Earth. 
Here's the sources we used. Thanks for listening, 